I'm Susan with Far West Garden Center and today I'm going to talk about how to grow beautiful, beautiful roses. Everyone has a passion in life and mine is definitely roses. So please, if you have any questions that I don't cover in the video, come by and I will be happy to answer them for you. I have a rose care sheet that I've written as well as recommendations for roses that you can get behind the counter. So feel free to ask for that. And I think what I'll start with is the different varieties of the roses that, that are available. Um, the most, most common one is called the hybrid tea. And that would be this one right here. Pope John Paul, move this around a little bit so I can have some room. This would be a hybrid tea. And it's, this one is one of my favorites. It's a white called Pope John Paul. And the thing with the hybrid tea that is really spe special is that it has the long stems that you want for cutting. So when you think of the romantic rose that you give from the florist with the classic long stems, the pointed center, the fragrance generally speaking, the hybrid tea is the one that you want to go for. So that would be one. Another one that's very popular would be the Floribunda rose. And this one is called Jump for Joy. It's one of my favorite peach roses in the world. There's a gentleman at the Huntington Garden Library that it's his favorite rose and he's the rosarian there so you know it's a good one. The Floribunda is a shorter rose and it's known more for garden roses like when you look out your window and you want to see tons of color the Floribunda is the one that you want. Typically comes in clusters. You will see one per stem every once in a great while but a very floriferous shrub and again known for garden color whereas your hybrid tea is known more for the long stems with the classic uh, pointed center. So a grandiflora, this one here, Anna's Promise, is a cross between a floribunda and a hybrid tea. So what you'll find with the grandiflora is that sometimes you'll get one per stem and other times you'll get clusters. The grandiflora is a taller shrub, so typically put it in the back of the bed so you can give it the, the height, the room that it requires for the height involved. A lot of people want to do container roses, so you can definitely do a mini in a, in a container. This one is called Sunblaze. They only get about two to three feet, so you can put them in a container on a front porch, a sunny porch or whatnot, and it really is great. Another rose that I really like is called Easy Elegance, and this rose has really grown on me. It's an own root rose, so that means it's typically a lot more disease resistant. This, is, this one is called Yellow Brick Road. They're all named after songs, which is cute. Very, very healthy, very, very shiny leaves, very floriferous, and I really like it because it is an own root rose. It's gonna be a lot less disease resistant. These have really grown on me. And the last one that is most popular would be the tree rose. We call this a standard rose. This one is Julia Child, which is a fabulous yellow. It's a floribunda on a standard tree. I call it the lollipop shape. And the Julia Child is a great yellow. And you just uh, kind of keep it pruned in the ball shape and you should be good to go. The next thing I want to do is talk about planting a rose bush. When you plant a rose bush, you want to amend the soil. We typically have very clay soil here, so what you're going to want to do is amend it with our soil building conditioner. That will help to loosen up the clay, uh, encourage drainage, and it will also add nutrients to the soil. So you want to mix that about 50-50 with the, the earth soil. And you're going to want to dig the hole about one and a half times the depth of the root ball and two feet the width of the root ball. That's a good rule of thumb. And when you put the rose in the, you want to mix it in really good. You might want to use some of our root stimulator to help it really get going. And a, a good rule of thumb would be to put maybe one or two inches of mulch around the rose. And that helps to keep the weeds at bay, helps keep the ground cool, and, and it also helps to prevent um, insects from getting under. So what you might want to do is do one inch or two inches of mulch on top and that helps to prevent weeds from growing and it also helps keep the, the ground moist and it also over time will decompose and that will fortify the rose as well. So the mulch is a great thing to do. And then when you want to water in the beginning, 
when you water in the beginning, you definitely want to do it deep and less frequently. In the beginning, you probably want to water every day. And then once you see that the rose is getting established, then you can cut back a little bit. But the, the rule of thumb is to have it be deep watering less often than a little sprinkle here and there. Much better to do it in the morning because if the leaves are wet, it acts kind of like a magnifying glass and the sun can burn the leaves. So it's a really good idea to, if you can, to water, water in the morning at the base. So that's a good, good rule of thumb. The fertilizing, what you're gonna wanna do in the beginning of spring, when it's just starting to leaf out, even before the buds appear. I like fish emulsion, because that really gives it a shot of nitrogen. You could also give it a high nitrogen rose, or high nitrogen food that will really get the leaves generated. And then as it keeps going after the first flush of bloom, then you can um, start using a high phosphorus fertilizer, which will keep the, the cycle of bloom going. But in the initial time of spring, you definitely want to do high nitrogen to get the leaves generated. And then after that first flush of bloom, then you're going to want to use something with the high phosphorus, which is the middle number. And like I said, feel free to come by and I'll be happy to walk you through the choices of the fertilizer. When you prune a rose, the idea that you want is to have an open center. So you're going to cut the rose by a third or half, depending. And once you cut the rose, you want to defoliate. You want to take off all the leaves and an open center because you want good air circulation. And you want three to five canes so that you have three to five really, really larger than a pencil. So anything smaller than a pencil, you're going to want to cut out. And when you're pruning, keep in mind that if you want ex exhibition roses that you want a few but really beautiful roses, you want to cut you want to prune heavier. If you prune lighter, you'll get more flowers, but they won't be as, as uh, good for exhibition, that kind of thing. A lot of the exhibitors cut the rose back pretty far so that they can get a few prized blooms, but most gardeners just cut it by a third or so, and you'll get a lot of flowers. They just may not be as beautiful as somebody would want to do for, a, for exhibition. When you cut a rose for the house, the rule of thumb is you want to cut above a five leaflet about a quarter inch above and you want to cut it at an angle so it helps the water drain down you don't want water sitting ideally and you want to cut it down so that there are at least a couple of leaflets underneath with five leaves so that because you're essentially it's a mini pruning whenever you're trimming a rose off the bush it's like a mini pruning so one rule of thumb is to always the out facing leaf because when you have a new stem come out you don't want it to get caught in the middle and then get cross canes so that's a really good rule of thumb as well. Deadheading is the same rule of thumb where you want to cut it above the five leaves. One thing that we want to talk about is insects. The things that we typically deal with here in Idaho would be aphids, mildew, and black spot. So in the very beginning of spring, you'll see a preponderance of aphids. That's something that's very common. It's very easily rectified with the morning shower. When you're out there watering, this is the exception to the rule when it's okay to get the leaves wet. I usually just take a, a hose with the shower head on it and really, really rinse off with a hard rinse and just kind of hold it so that you don't take off the delicate buds. And that will help get rid of the aphids. Another thing you can do is insecticidal soap or the neem oil. The neem oil is good because it suffocates the aphid and the subsequent eggs, but depending on how good or bad it is, if you get it at the beginning of the season when they first start coming out, insecticidal soap will be just fine. Another malady that you get on roses would be mildew, and that's usually exacerbated by warm days and cool nights and high humidity. So the goal with mildew is always try to plant your roses at least three feet apart, two and a half if you really squeeze it. You definitely want to keep, again, that air circulation, which helps the, the rose from getting um, mildew. Another thing that roses typically get is black spot. And if you have black spot on the roses and the leaves fall off, you're going to want to clean that area real well because the black spot is spread by wet. So if you tend to water over water, you might get more prone to having the black spot. I like to use systemic, but that's there's one thing I want to tell you about systemic. That's when it feeds the rose and also gives you disease resistance at the same time. For the gardener that's not really out there a lot, that might work well for you, but keep in mind that anything that bites the plant, even if it's a butterfly or a ladybug, is gonna die because it does kill all insects that bite the plant. One thing I wanna talk about are rose companions. The Roseanne geranium is great. The Mudstead lavender 
Scabiosa or Napita, the cat mint. And lamb's ear can add a really nice shimmery silver to the, to the uh, landscape as well. I like to incorporate additional scent, so things like sweet alyssum and lemon thyme are great for planting at the base of the rose. So a lot of people ask me what my favorite roses are, so I'm going to give you maybe one from each color. One of my favorite pinks is called Touch of Class. Another one that we carry is called Bewitched. Orange, I would say Fragrant Cloud or Jump for Joy, which we have right here. For red, I would say Mr. Lincoln, I'm going to give you two, <laughs> or Chrysler Imperial. Chrysler Imperial is the progeny of Mr. Lincoln. For lavender, lavenders typically are very fragrant. It seems to be the case in most all lavenders. Heirloom is a good one, as is Neptune. For yellow, you can't beat Julia Child. That's a Floribunda rose, very floriferous, beautiful butter yellows. It's named after Julia Child. She liked butter, so there's no surprise there that it's yellow. For white, I like the Pope John Paul and another one called Sugar Moon that smells really nice. For blends, Double Delight, Romantica's Peter Male. And I do want to talk a little bit about the David Austin English roses. Those are beautiful roses that tend to be really large shrubs, but they have that beautiful fragrance. The David Austins, the Molyneux, and the Princess Alexander of Kent are a couple of my favorites. And the ones that have the exceptional fragrance, which is typically why we want to grow roses in the first place, is because we want to bring them in the house, we want to give them to friends. The most with the exceptional fragrance would be Perfume Delight, Memorial Day, Ebb Tide, Secrets Out, Miss All American Beauty, and Melody Parfume. So I think I covered most of the basics of good rose care. And again, I'm Susan. If you have any questions, please come by and see me and I'll be happy to help you out.